Uh, all right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this seminar. Uh, I'm David Tilbrook from the Department of Fundamental and Theoretical Physics at ANU. And I'd like to start, as usual, by acknowledging the people of the Ngunnawal Nation, the traditional owners of lands upon which we are located here at ANU. And of course, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of lands all around Australia. We'd like to pay our respects to their leaders, past, present and emerging. The series of seminars has been organised by Murray Batchelor and many other members of the organising committee on behalf of the Theoretical Physics Group within the Australian Institute of Physics. You are most welcome to join our group. It's free to all members of the Australian Institute of Physics, of course. Uh, to do that, just log into your membership portal uh, on the AIP website. You will see the Theoretical Physics Group name under Topical Groups in the Membership Profile section, and you can just click to join there. Um, previous seminars we've had as a part of this series have covered a diverse range of topics. Uh, Professor Tracy Slatia talked about dark matter. Professor Raymond Volkus gave us a seminar on the Fermilab G-2 experiment. We've had a fascinating seminar from Professor Susan Coppersmith on quantum stochastic resonance. Gerard Milburn talked about the thermodynamics of clocks. Uh, Carl Bender gave us a really interesting talk on PT symmetry and it's implications for fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics. And the most recent talk was given by Professor Sagado Bose from University College London on the topic of the quantum nature of gravity, um, specifically from the point of view of laboratory scale experiments uh, that might be done to investigate the properties of gravitation. It was a fascinating um, look um, at the possibility of setting up an experiment to detect the presence of entanglement via the gravitational field between pairs of nanoparticles in a pair of stern gerlach interferometers. So all of those talks have been really good. Uh, if you've missed them or you'd like to watch them again, they're available to view at the AIP YouTube channel. Today's speaker uh, is Dr. Matthew Woolley from the University of New South Wales. Although he's a fellow Territorian, being located here in Canberra at the Australian Defence Force Academy. Dr. Woolley has been involved for quite a few years with a very interesting area of research which looks at the properties of massive mechanical systems from a quantum mechanical point of view um, and their interactions with electromagnetic cavities, for example, and many other properties. And uh, more generally, of course, with some matters involved in the development of theory for the description and analysis of those sorts of systems. Uh, of particular interest to today's seminar is the work that he's done with his collaborators looking at the entanglement between massive micromechanical oscillators. Um, there are other examples, of course, of macroscopic systems which behave quantum mechanically, superfluids and superconducting systems come immediately to mind, of course. Um, and then there are gaseous systems, macroscopic quantum systems in the form of Bose-Einstein condensate, and there are other mechanical systems that have been looked at from time to time. But I think it's really fascinating um, to talk about uh, massive mechanical systems that are constrained to quantum mechanical degrees of freedom and that interact quantum mechanically. So to enlighten us about this really interesting area of research, Dr. Woolley's talk today is entitled Quantum Measurement and Control with Massive Mechanical Oscillators. Over to you, please, Matt. Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction, David, and thanks uh, to all the organisers of this uh, seminar series. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so thanks in particular to Murray and Margaret uh, for their part in organising these seminars. Uh, so yeah, as was uh, already introduced, I'll be talking about quantum uh, measurement and control uh, with massive mechanical oscillators. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the people who supported me in this work, uh, particularly the Air Force Office of Scientific Research uh, and the ARC Centre. Uh, for engineered quantum systems, which of course is located uh, at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Um, the work I'll be describing today, uh, you know, it's a blend of theory and experiments, certainly started with theoretical work, but I'll also be talking quite a lot about the experimental implementations and results. Uh, I hope that's ac acceptable for this uh, seminar series. Uh, so the experiments uh, primarily were conducted in the lab of uh, Mika Salampa at Dalto University, and in particular led by his uh, postdocs, uh, Kasparopoulon-Kolpi and Laura Messia de, de, de Lepine. Uh, 
the theory work kind of started with Arch Clerk now at the University of Chicago, uh, and more recently we've done, uh, I guess, kind of some, some extra theoretical work, uh, both locally with uh, Diego Bernal Garcia, Lu Xun Huang, Andrei Marcinchenko, uh, and also with Ian Peterson at ANU and Shan Ma, who's a former student and uh, now back working in China. All right, so the plan for today, uh, I'm first going to talk about mechanical systems in the quantum regime in a general sense. Uh, a lot of people have been working uh, in this area over the past decade. Then I'll talk specifically about how we can do a particular type of measurement called a two mode back action evading measurement in these systems. How this can then be used uh, in combination with a control protocol for the uh, detection of stabilized mechanical entanglement and how this can be further expanded to explore what is known as a quantum mechanics free subspace with uh, massive mechanical oscillators. Um, so these kind of three are kind of a combination of theory and experiment. And then I'll talk a bit briefly at the end if I have time uh, about some kind of uh, experimental proposals going forward with respect to force sensing uh, many body kind of optomechanical control and some kind of theoretical tools around generalized uh, Lindblad uh, master equations. All right, so starting with mechanical uh, systems in the quantum regime, uh, where does this story start? Well, I think you can kind of uh, perhaps take it back uh, to these papers here. So, you know, we have uh, these kind of uh, representative degrees of freedom of kind of massive mechanical oscillators, right? So you may think, well, what is the kind of, uh, you know, position, uh, you know, uh, Q hat and momentum P hat of your mechanical mode? You know, typically, right, of course, you wouldn't think about this thing quantum mechanically at all. Um, but, you know, uh, there's kind of a local angle in the history of this that sort of in looking at the kind of ultimate limits to measurement uh, in quantum systems, uh, in, and in particular, the limitations to measurements of gravitational uh, wave observatories or indeed atomic force microscopes, uh, people like Dan Walls and Jared Milburn a long time ago now thought, well, you know, one part of that limitation is the quantum noise associated with that kind of macroscopic mechanical degree of freedom. So why don't we just put hats on these kind of uh, macroscopic mechanical degree of freedoms representing those fundamental modes and look at the consequences. Right. So at this point in time, of course, this was kind of something that was very far removed from, you know, possible uh, experimental investigation, uh, but times have moved on and that is no longer the case. Okay. So why study these in general, right? So the original motivation was basically incorporating uh, this kind of treatment into an investigation of the fundamental limits to measurement. Um, I would say that's maybe not completely the kind of major priority at this point in time. I would say the major okay, reasons or motivators now are looking at tests of quantum mechanics with massive objects and maybe a level down from tests, just demonstrations of quantum behavior with these objects. As has already been noted at the outset, perhaps a very interesting, though extremely challenging direction is, well, maybe we can sort of put these massive mechanical oscillators into a regime where both kind of gravity and uh, quantum mechanics simultaneously impact the outcomes of those experiments. For example, can we put a massive oscillator into some coherent superposition, which might imply the superposition of the associated gravitational fields and what might the consequence of that be? A lot of people working on that now. There was a previous talk along these lines in this very seminar series. And sort of maybe a, a slightly more grounded thing to look at perhaps, uh, uh, can these mechanical oscillators be used uh, for signal processing or transduction in some quantum technology application? In particular, the big one here is, can mechanical oscillators be used as some kind of um, intermediary uh, to sort of coherently uh, convert between microwave and optical radiation for, for quantum technology applications? All right, so that's kind of uh, the why. Uh, what about is this something can, that can actually be done, uh, you know, or is this still some kind of theoretical fantasy? Uh, the answer is, well, yeah, the, you actually can. Uh, and it's actually been the case for more than a decade that uh, people have been able to uh, control these kind of mechanical degrees of freedom into the quantum regime. So the first uh, was basically some bulk acoustic wave resonator, which was resonantly coupled to a, a superconducting qubit uh, at about you know, six gigahertz or so. Subsequently, uh, there were some experiments around sort of having some vibrating plate as shown here, uh, cooled into its quantum ground state. It's uh, the ground state of the fundamental mechanical mode of that vibrating plate using the back action of a microwave field. Or similarly, uh, having one of these kind of nano beam resonators cooled to its quantum ground state by virtue of the back action of an optical field in this kind of optomechanical crystal arrangement. Okay, so this is all cooling into the 
quantum ground state of the mechanical degree of freedom. It was first done about a decade ago now. More recently, a variety of other mechanical degrees of freedom have been sort of controlled and cooled in their, in their ground state, including surface acoustic wave resonances, bulk acoustic wave resonances, and perhaps the most recent and perhaps the most interesting in some sense from you know, really pushing the limits of quantum mechanics and the interplay with gravity, the ability to control the kind of fundamental motional degree of freedom of a levitated optomechanical system into its quantum ground state. Right? That was just achieved for the first time last year, and it's actually now been achieved in a couple of different ways as well, using both uh, you know, optical back action and measurement and feedback control. All right, so is it just the ground state? Well, no, it's more than the ground state. It's kind of also single phonon control, right? Can we deterministically implant a phonon, the quantum of uh, mechanical vibration into a, a massive mechanical oscillator that was done some time ago? A variety of squeeze Gaussian states have been prepared, squeeze states of a single mechanical degree of freedom, entanglement between two mechanical degrees of freedom. This is a meandering strip line resonator with a mechanical oscillator there and there. I'll talk a bit more about this uh, work later. And furthermore, at least with kind of low excitation numbers with low numbers of phonons, uh, there's also an ability to uh, prepare superpositions of low kind of um, number uh, phonon states. Uh, still outstanding, the big thing still outstanding here is kind of large scale non-Gaussian states, let's say, and that remains an active area of investigation. All right, so I'm going to talk about basically uh, the build up to uh, entanglement type experiments and also measurements uh, pushing the kind of quantum bounds of measurement with mechanical systems. All right, so the first part of this is going to be something called a two mode back action evasion measurement. Okay, and this is actually going to turn out to be central to looking at sensing beyond a conventional quantum bounds and also central to the generation and indeed verification of entanglement of massive mechanical oscillators. All right, so first a back action evading measurement, maybe some of you know this stuff well anyway, but I'll go over it for those who don't. Uh, so pretty much a definition uh, up here, a back action evading measurement, it's a measurement in which the back action, you know, a la Heisenberg associated with the measurement does not perturb any observable, which is dynamically coupled to the thing that you were measuring in the first place. All right, so the, the prototypical example of a not BAE measurement is that of position, right? Suppose you have a, a harmonic oscillator, uh, for example, as shown here, it doesn't have to be a harmonic oscillator, but it's the harmonic oscillator here. Uh, suppose you wanna measure position X, you measure position X, you necessarily perturb P, Okay, but then what happens to X? Well, you can calculate the Heisenberg equation for the evolution of X just via the commutator and Heisenberg's equation, right? And you see it's dynamically coupled to P, okay? That is, you measure X, you perturb P, P dynamically couples back into X, okay? Therefore, it's not back action evading. What can be back action evading? Well, the classic example, well, one classic example is a so-called quadrature of a position coordinate, okay? So we can break up position, for example, into like a cosine and a, a, the position of the harmonic oscillator, at least, into a cosine quadrature, oscillating at some frequency omega m, uh, and kind of an out of phase part, uh, oscillating at the same frequency, but out of phase, right? We call capital X here, capital P here, a, uh, a quadrature operator, okay? So we can ask, well, what is the kind of evolution of uh, these quadrature operators X and P, and we can go through the same uh, calculation essentially with the, the Hamiltonian of this uh, oscillator looked at in a, in a rotating frame. And we see that, yes, we measure that capital X right there, we perturb P, but X is no longer dynamically coupled to P. Therefore, we can make a back action evading measurement of this uh, quadrature operator X. Okay, so that's an example of a uh, back action evading measurement of a single. Uh, a single oscillator. Well, can we extend this uh, to two mode back action evading measurements? Um, well, yes, we can. Uh, and in particular, there's a particular way of doing this, which is gonna turn out to be useful uh, in this kind of measurement and control of uh, mechanical systems case. Okay, so in particular, we're gonna look at the back action evading measurement of a so-called collective quadrature of two oscillators now, 
Now we're going to look at it in a reference frame with respect to a so-called negative mass oscillator. Okay, so setting aside for now what is the physical origin of this Hamiltonian, let's just look at this Hamiltonian. Okay, so we have oscillator quadrature x1, we have a second oscillator with quadrature operator x2. Okay, we're going to take the sum, i.e. define a collective quadrature of two oscillators. We're going to couple it to some probe system with some representative operator, we're just going to call it A, with some coupling strength lambda. Okay, so it's a collective quadrature measurement of the two oscillators by virtue of its coupling to a probe system characterized by the operator A. And suppose we add in some dynamics for the uh, system composed of oscillators one and two. In particular, we're going to look at a Hamiltonian in this form. So this uh, is basically a harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian for oscillator one with some associated frequency capital omega. And suppose we actually take another oscillator with a Hamiltonian given with a negative frequency. If we think about this in terms of what does the classical Hamiltonian look like, we could say, well, this is kind of like a negative mass oscillator, an effective neg negative mass oscillator. And then what happens if I rewrite these, this Hamiltonian, in the first line here, entirely in terms of collective quadrature operators, right? So I say, well, x plus is like x1 plus x2 divided by root 2, and you know, x minus is x1 minus x2 divided by root 2, and so on and so forth. What happens is the coupling just looks like this. You have A coupled to x plus, okay? So therefore, the probe enables a measurement of x plus, and we get this kind of funny looking form of this kind of oscillator. It's kind of, it's kind of a harmonic oscillator, but kind of not. It's kind of an effective, an effective oscillator composed from two oscillators. You can figure out what the dynamics corresponding to this Hamiltonian look like, right? So suppose we measure X plus, the back action is associated with the canonically uh, conjugate observable, which is P plus. And by virtue of this dynamics right here, X plus is dynamically coupled to P minus, P plus is dynamically coupled to X minus. So what happens is we measure X plus, the back action goes on to P plus, which is dynamically coupled to X minus, which is not dynamically coupled back into X plus. So it's kind of like uh, an oscillator, a regular oscillator in the sense that X, when you measure X, you perturb P, it's not like a regular oscillator uh, in the sense that that perturbation of P does not feed back into the dynamics, okay? So with this kind of positive mass, negative mass oscillator, you, you can make these uh, two mode back action rating measurements. And this will turn out to be useful from a, a sensing and a control perspective. All right, so that's kind of the, the general framework. Well, how, how would you implement such a system? I mean, surely you can't implement a negative mass. Of course, it's a bit of a trick of terminology, which I should say I didn't invent. Uh, if you go into, if you have uh, two oscillators, right? These are my two mechanical oscillators denoted by B1 and B2 coupled to a common electromagnetic cavity mode with resonance frequency omega A. Uh, and furthermore, if you have uh, some couplings as shown here, so A dagger A, that's just the photon number of the cavity essentially, B1 plus B1 dagger is essentially the position of oscillator one, B2 plus B2 dagger is essentially the position of oscillator two. Uh, and you have G1, which is just this coupling uh, from oscillator one to the cavity and G2, the coupling from oscillator two to the cavity. Okay, the form of these is kind of, you would call, refer to this as kind of like a, a standard radiation pressure type coupling, okay, which is kind of standard in kind of optomechanical and electromechanical systems. Furthermore, if we have that kind of raw uh, Hamiltonian uh, and we drive the cavity omega A at two frequencies above and below its resonance frequency, which is to say omega A plus or minus, uh, the average of the two uh, mechanical oscillator frequencies, and we go into a, a rotating frame, uh, then we can actually re-express this Hamiltonian in a rotating frame, such that really it has that kind of positive mass, negative mass form, uh, which is here represented in terms of the collective quadrature operators, the effective oscillation frequency of this kind of joint oscillator given by uh, basically half the difference in the uh, two raw mechanical oscillator frequencies, omega-2 and omega-1. Furthermore, uh, we see that we have basically a coupling of a quadrature of the cavity field to this uh, collective uh, mechanical quadrature operator, X plus, right? So therefore the cavity can measure X plus essentially, 
it has some uh, effective coupling, uh, which in some linearized approximation is just basically the average of the single, what you would call the single photon of the mechanical couplings multiplied by the steady state amplitude of the field uh, in the cavity to which they are coupled. All right, so here this kind of microwave uh, cavity optomechanical system provides a simple uh, realization of that two mode back action evading measurement. All right, so just to make this a little bit more explicit, like how would you actually measure such a thing? Um, well, you know, you kind of want two strong tones, right? So they're my kind of what I'm going to refer to as the pump tones, right? But then to actually show that the measurement is working as claimed, you actually need to probe it in addition to the uh, to the raw measurements, if you like. So that omega minus uh, and omega plus, that's kind of in some sense my official measurement. Uh, and then, you know, to actually interrogate what the measurement is doing, you can sort of just uh, to tune from that a little bit and at a much lower amplitude, uh, some, some probe tones, right? So there's kind of four driving tones in general. The drive tones will scatter uh, off the two mechanical oscillators, potentially up and potentially down. Uh, the scattering towards the cavity resonance is enhanced, uh, right? So what you will see uh, on the output spectrum when you do that, you'll see kind of scattering events from this tone to there and also to there and scattering of this uh, tone to there and to there. Okay, so what you'll see in a measurement are basically these kind of additional peaks on your spectrum, uh, on the output spectrum, which is associated with scattering of the drive tones. Okay, so the situation in, in thermal equilibrium, if we like, uh, of these kind of collective quadrature operators, you just have basically some thermal width associated with these states, which you may look at in kind of this X plus P plus, this collective uh, mechanical quadrature operator frame. Um, suppose our strong tones, the blue and the red there, are configured such that kind of our official or our strong measurement is of X plus, uh, then what you expect is that by virtue of the measurement, uh, X plus, so this is some kind of noise ellipse in the X plus P plus plane, uh, the variance or the noise in X plus is not affected but the back action associated with the measurement goes on to the conjugate observable, which is P plus. So that's denoted by the fact that there's an increase in the noise or the variance associated with that back action. Uh, right, so instead of a noise circle that you have when it's just sitting there, you have a noise ellipse where you've added the back action noise onto this P plus observable. Then what you can do is, well, we have these other uh, tones and we can use those tones to sort of, by setting basically their detunings and their relative phase, uh, we can basically probe or scan around that noise ellipse in the X plus P plus plane. Okay, so we can officially measure X plus, we can use these additional weak probe tones to basically scan around uh, that noise ellipse in the X plus P plus plane. Uh, basically, you can measure by tuning the phases some linear combination of X plus and P plus, right? So you should be able to map out basically uh, that noise dependence and show where the back action is going uh, in your measurement. All right, so this was kind of like a, a preparatory experiment, let's say. Uh, so basically the, the, the key result, it kind of works as advertised. Here are the, here are the output spectra. Uh, so those peaks that you're looking at, are those ones there. Um, there's some noise floor typically underneath, which you kind of subtract away. Uh, but they're the peaks you see right there. Uh, so these is the output noise spectrum. Uh, scattered off the mechanical oscillators, right? So it's it's basically separated by half the difference of those mechanical oscillator frequencies. Uh, and as you uh, you know measure more strongly, so this C is a cooperativity parameter, which is basically how strongly coupled you are, uh, which basically tells you about the strength of the measurement. Okay, uh, and it all works kind of neatly. Um, so you know, if, if you're sufficiently uh, inclined, uh, and you know, you know, kind of input output theory in quantum optics, you can go straight ahead and calculate the output spectrum. Uh, under mild approximations, you get a sum of uh, a couple of Lorentzians um, either side of the cavity resonance frequency. Um, and you know, uh, the thing that you actually measure is not, in fact, directly. I mean, you don't directly measure the kind of mechanical noise spectrum. Uh, you actually measure an output noise spectrum, which is fairly uh, simply related to the actual output uh, noise spectrum that you do measure. Okay, so this is the thing that you would actually measure, um, which is actually what's shown here. And then from that, you can kind of back out uh, 
pretty much in a direct measurement what the noise spectrum of that uh, of the collective mechanical quadrature observable x plus is okay so so the measurement kind of works as advertised it appears at least at least from the measurement of x plus um, you know we claimed we're evading back action so i guess you know it's kind of worthwhile showing that there is in fact back action in the measurement somewhere uh, and so that the probe tones allow you to do that, right? So again, the official measurement is of X plus, but you can actually explore the measurement by varying the phase and uh, detuning of those uh, probe tones, right? So again, what you actually measure is the output noise spectrum. Integrate that, essentially what you get out is a photon flux. So that's what that in out is. Um, you have an independent read on all of these parameters. Uh, so what you can then infer, you kind of measure this one directly, it's the integrated output noise spectrum. You can infer back in theta, uh, which is basically the, it's essentially the variance associated with this uh, collective quadrature operator right here. Okay, so that n theta is essentially the variance of this operator right here. Right, so the measurement works by, you measure that thing, you infer that thing because you know all these parameters. Uh, and you can also just go ahead straight away and calculate this thing from theory. Okay, so these lines are the theoretical calculations. Uh, the dots, of course, are the data points. Again, going from like a fairly weak to a stronger to a strongest measurement. Um, as you increase the measurement strength, this is fairly typical. It means more circulating power, uh, which typically correlates to more scatter uh, in your experimental data. Um, so there's also some spurious heating here as well. So just to be clear, so at this point at zero, right, you're measuring X plus where you don't expect any back action. In the middle, theta is equal to 90 degrees. That's where you're measuring P plus pretty much entirely, which is where the back action is a maximum. And then by 180, you're back to measuring X plus. Okay, so, so that picture I drew uh, before, right, that we're kind of scanning around here is kind of legitimate. Uh, you know, we have a, a back action evading measurement, which is working. And, you know, with the probe tones, we can investigate exactly where that back action is going. All right, and, you know, it's kind of important in these things that, you know, we have a good quantitative understanding of what the measurement is doing. Uh, indeed, we do have that. Um, you know, I won't go into all the details here, uh, but the point is C, cooperativity, this is a measure of the measurement strength. Um, the official measurement is of X plus, right? So you would expect if everything were perfect, those red points, uh, which is basically telling me the variance of X plus, uh, that should be a straight line. Uh, what actually happens in practice is the, you, you actually heat the thing uh, and the, the, you heat the cavity, right? Which has a kind of a flow on effect to the mechanics. And so that kind of uh, line right there is basically the kind of spurious thermal heating uh, that you get. Um, that dashed line right there is the actual back action associated with the measurement. Okay, so you do get a little bit of heating as you kind of increase the power of the measurement. Again, you can calculate all of these things uh, quantitatively. Uh, we won't get into the details perhaps, but just notionally, uh, we have an effective occupation of that uh, collective quadrature operator X plus, which is composed of the thermal stuff, potentially the back action stuff, uh, and also some imprecision noise associated with the measurement. Um, so, so there's multiple contributors. Uh, typically you're operating in a regime where the imprecision noise is relatively small. Okay, so because you're operating that regime where the imprecision noise is uh, relatively small, then most of your kind of occupation is associated with just the thermal and quantum fluctuations sitting there in the back action of the measurement and the kind of the effect of kind of the subsequent amplification chain is attenuated by increasing the measurement strength, essentially by increasing that cooperativity parameter. All right, so what's the key point there? The key point is that two mode back action evading measurement and they, it provides a tool uh, that enables you to characterize the collective dynamics of these mechanical oscillators, okay? What's more, it's quantitatively very well understood, okay? And that's central to everything that will subsequently follow, okay? So again, now we'll move on to the actual kind of, that's the measurement. Now we'll look at the kind of control side of things, okay? So, so how do we actually get these mechanical oscillators into a somewhat kind of interesting state, i.e. basically a non-thermal state? Uh, and what we'll try to do is get them into a two mode squeeze state, right? So this kind of work, this, this kind of work goes back to these proposals, uh, 
pretty much all the experiments I'll talk about actually go back to these proposals. Uh, and so, you know, in the subsequent section, I guess we'll see kind of the final implementation of these proposals. Um, all right, stabilized uh, mechanical entanglement, experimental work uh, done by Mika Salampa's group. All right, I probably don't need to go into entanglement uh, in this audience, and I expect there's kind of, you know, uh, people in the audience who have a great deal of knowledge on sort of various hierarchies of quantum correlations and what have you. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, suffice to say, for those perhaps less well uh, averse in these things, the, the basic notion of entanglement is that you cannot completely describe a part of a system without making some kind of reference to the whole. Um, there's a long history of entanglement experiments, you know, particularly in optics. Um, and more recently with spin degrees of freedom. But what about entanglement of motion? In some sense, that's what kind of, you know, Einstein and friends were really talking about back in the day anyway. Uh, and I'd say the first demonstration of the entanglement of emotional, emotional degrees of freedom, um, well, fu fundamental, I should be careful what I say, I think, uh, fundamental uh, mechanical mode of a system, let's say, was with uh, trapped ions uh, by Weinland's group, 2009. Uh, there it's just the motion of two individual uh, ions. Uh, the entanglement of a fundamental motional degree of freedom with a microwave field, uh, that's been done before. But the idea here was to really get the distinct uh, physical separation and entangle uh, two clearly distinct uh, mechanical degrees of freedom. All right, so, so what is the basic protocol uh, for generating uh, these uh, entangled mechanical oscillators? Um, so basically the protocol comes about by combining that negative mass dynamics that we already saw and actually which will be kind of dual purposed as both part of the entanglement generation and as part of the measurement scheme. So we kind of dual purpose that negative mass dynamics, combine it with what is known as the reservoir engineering. So basically this is controlling a system by engineering its dissipation, okay? If we do, if we combine those things in just the right way, then we can kind of come up with, you know, what I would argue is kind of the, the optimally simple uh, way of generating uh, entanglement in a realizable manner between these mechanical degrees of freedom. All right, so let's let's look at the reservoir engineering side of things. Um, so here again, so apologies for the change of notation. These came from separate talks. This is omega C is now the cavity resonance frequency. Uh, suppose that we drive uh, the cavity again. It's coupled to two mechanical oscillators. Uh, we drove we drive on the lower side band corresponding to one mechanical resonance. And we drive on the upper side band corresponding to the other mechanical resonance, uh, which you know appears like a fairly simple configuration, right? You know, it's a it's a it's a nonlinear Hamiltonian. Drive it like that, linearize, get an effective ha linear Hamiltonian, effective quadratic Hamiltonian. I mean, of course, uh, and, and go. Uh, and it turns out, you know, even though it's simple, it actually turns out to be rather useful. Um, so anyway, if you go through like the standard analysis, linearize the, the couplings, right? Set your driving frequencies just right. The Hamiltonian that you get looks like this right here. So what is everything here? Uh, well, as before, that capital omega, that's really just half the difference of the uh, mechanical resonance frequencies. Uh, so A is the cavity mode operator, uh, B1 and B2 are the mechanical mode operators. We're actually re-expressing this Hamiltonian in terms of different operators, and you may recognize these things. So beta one and beta two are basically two mode Bogolubov operators uh, with a mixing, which is really parameterized by this parameter R. So B1 and B2, they're just the annihilation operators associated with the uh, mechanical oscillators one and two. Um, so, so what do we get in terms of the Hamiltonian, right? So we have these Bogolubov operators, right? Two mode. Uh, with this driving, and doing the standard linearization, you, the coupling you get, basically you get a coupling, which is like a hopping or a, a beam splitter like coupling between the cavity mode A and the sum of these two Bogolubov operators. Okay, so, so the scenario you have is you have the mechanics, they're coupled to a cavity mode and the cavity mode is damped fast as compared with the mechanical oscillators. So this basically describes a sloshing of energy between the cavity and the mechanical oscillators, but the cavity is damped much faster, okay? So therefore you can use this interaction to kind of pull energy, pull excitations out of the mechanics. So it's a cooling, but it's cooling to a particular state. 
right? So it turns out that the, uh, I guess the, uh, what, what to say, the, the simultaneous, uh, so the eigenstate corresponding to the, the, sorry, the simultaneous eigenstate corresponding to the zero eigenvalues of both of these Bogolubov operators is none other than the two mode squeeze state, which as many of you will be aware, uh, is kind of the canonical uh, continuous variable two mode uh, entangled state. Okay, so, so something that we would want to do is ask the question, can we simultaneously call essentially to the ground state of these two operators? This Hamiltonian doesn't quite achieve that. It calls to the, to, you know, the, the ground state associated with the sum of these Bogolubov modes, right? So it's, it doesn't quite achieve what we want, but there's this other bit, right? Because of this kind of negative uh, mass, positive mass dynamics, which originally we can express in terms of like B1 and B2, but actually turns out the form of the Hamiltonian is exactly the same, even once we express it in terms of these Bogolubov operators. So yes, we're kind of calling the sum of these, uh, you know, Bogolubov operators, but we're also doing something else here. And that's something else that's going to turn out to help us. All right. So this is kind of what I just said. So this part allows us basically to call uh, to the zero eigenstate of the sum of Bogolubov operators. But what is this part over here doing? Well, uh, I can rewrite my kind of positive mass, negative mass part of my Hamiltonian in terms of the sum, which is basically beta one plus beta two and the difference beta one minus beta two. And what does it look like? Well, it just looks like, again, it just looks like basically, you know, a beam split or a, a hopping type interaction. Uh, and again, just to hammer home the point, this is all, it's been expressed a few different ways, but this is all the same kind of free Hamiltonian of the mechanics, right, as before. What does that mean? I'm calling the sum directly here. The sum is coupled to the difference. Therefore, I'm calling simultaneously the sum and the difference, okay? Calling the sum and the difference simultaneously is equivalent to calling uh, both of these modes independently, okay? Which is basically to say, Yes, this Hamiltonian is doing some kind of cooling on the mechanics in combination with the damping. Uh, it's actually cooling towards a two-mode squeeze state, the canonical entangled two-mode continuous variable state. Okay, so that's the protocol. That's how you, how you generate the two-mode squeeze state, i.e. the entangled state of the two mechanical oscillators. So that's the control or the generation side of the story. Uh, we have to detect it next. Okay, so we just detected as we did before, right? We've got the pumps now, which are detuned from the cavity resonance frequency uh, by the uh, mechanical resonance frequencies. Uh, we can add in probe tones, which are basically detuned from the cavity resonance frequency by half the average of the uh, mechanical oscillator frequencies. And then on top of the uh, pump spectrum, we can actually sort of, uh, the probe tones will also scatter as they did before in the measurement and we'll be able to integrate these peaks essentially, and they will tell us what is the variance of that X plus quadrature. Bearing in fact, uh, bearing in mind, uh, with those additional pump tones, we now expect two mode squeezing of that collective uh, quadrature observable uh, X plus. All right, and so that's just, that's the Hamiltonian associated with those uh, uh, probe tones just repeated. All right, so that's, that's kind of uh, the protocol, right? Two, uh, single cavity coupled to two, independently coupled to two mechanical oscillators, but the same cavity, uh, two pumps, two probes, uh, and that should be a, a sufficient setup uh, for the generation and detection of stabilized entanglement of the two mechanical oscillators. All right, so that's, that's kind of the basic theory. I'll talk now briefly uh, about the experiment uh, that took place again uh, in the group of Mika Salanpa at uh, Otto University in Finland, led by Kaspar Okolon Kopi. All right, so notionally, we can think about this as kind of, you know, basically like a Fabry Perot cavity, if you like, where both of the end mirrors are mechanically compliant. Um, just to give you kind of a, an indication of the scale of this experiment, um, you know, the mechanical resonances of order 10 megahertz, it's a microwave cavity, right? It's five and a half gigahertz. Uh, these are just the damping rates of the mechanics uh, and the line widths of the cavity. Um, here is kind of a micrograph of what it looks like. Uh, so there's this meandering strip line uh, microwave resonator. Uh, there's an input coupling capacitive and an output uh, uh, capacitive coupling. And there are the two mechanical oscillators 
uh, right there. So they're drum head, vibrating drum heads, essentially. 100 microns gives you a sense of scale. So the diameter of these things is approximately, you know, about 15 microns. All right, so that's the experimental setup. Basically, fire in microwaves, there's going to be four of them, and you measure the, the spectrum on the other side. And you use that to infer basically the entanglement between that thing there and that thing there in terms of the uh, fundamental uh, motion, the mechanical degrees of freedom of the fundamental modes of vibration. All right, uh, so yeah, so that's, I guess, a summary, or here is a summary of uh, the situation we're describing. Right, there are the uh, pump tones, right? In this experiment, you actually want to set the pump on the upper side of the mechanic of the cavity resonance. It's a little bit weaker than the one on the uh, uh, the lower frequency side of the cavity resonance. Okay, in terms of entanglement generation, you can optimize over that ratio, which is actually what we did. Uh, that prepares. A two mode squeeze state as I've described. So here's a little schematic, uh, which is trying to indicate that. So looking in kind of the X1, X2, right? They're the independent uh, mechanical X quadratures, right? You can kind of notionally think that, yeah, you've kind of two modes squeezed the fluctuations in X plus at the expense of increasing them uh, in X minus. And similarly, you can think of it like you've kind of squeezed the fluctuations in P minus and expanded the fluctuations uh, in P plus there. All right, those pump tones, right, they scatter off the mechanics uh, and they make a bit of a mess of what the pump, uh, the spectrum around the cavity resonance frequency looks like. Uh, the probe tones, however, don't make such a mess. Uh, they give you uh, very clean contributions. Basically, they're clean contributions because these tones are balanced uh, and symmetric and these ones are not balanced and not symmetric. Okay, that's why that's a mess and that's kind of clean in some sense. Basically, you can integrate those uh, output spectra, and that gives you the variance. It gives you x plus squared directly, so you have a direct measurement of the two-mode squeezing just by integrating those probe tones. Uh, what about the other ones? So, as some of you would be aware, no doubt, these kind of there's 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 variance on the Dwan criterion as well, I should say. But but one of the criteria you can use for the separability of two states is this thing called the Dwan criterion. Uh, and in terms of our uh, coordinates, basically it says the variance of uh, X plus and the variance of P minus for uh, the two oscillators to be separable, i.e. not entangled, this thing should be greater than or equal to one. Okay, what well, one kind of corresponds to zero point fluctuations. If you measure this thing uh, less than one, then you can infer that your oscillators are entangled so we need both of these quantities. I've said that we kind of directly measure this one through the probe. How do we get this one? Uh, well, in this particular setup, you actually have to infer it, right? So, uh, you know, we can calculate analytically to a high degree of accuracy what this pump spectrum should be, uh, but the way that we kind of inferred it for the sake of measurement was basically we kept this thing as a fit parameter on the pump spectrum, which is a bit of a mess. Uh, and, you know, we actually got a very good fit. Uh, we actually got a very good fit analytically without, without kind of using this as a fitting parameter. Um, but this allows us kind of an experimental measurement of this P minus, uh, the, the variance of P minus. All right, pump tone spectra. Okay, so uh, there's no fit here, I should point out. So, so these uh, uh, are two different sets of data points. This is the output spectrum associated with the scattering of the pump tones. Um, two different uh, configurations. Uh, so the blue data points uh, correspond to uh, what's called a sideband cooling. So that's basically when you're not pumping on the uh, above, that's when you're not pumping above the cavity resonance frequency. And red is the two mode squeezing when you're kind of pumping both below and above the uh, cavity resonance frequency. Uh, since this spectrum was kind of central to our measurement, uh, it was kind of important uh, that we actually really got a, a very good analytical fit uh, to, to these results. And, and the way you do that basically, so you know, all the Hamiltonians and everything I've shown you thus far, I mean, everything I've shown is quite simple. Uh, simple Hamiltonians do not reproduce uh, this level of experimental data, right? So the key point is you have to keep all the rotating terms. Uh, and you have to keep all the detunings. Um, so, you know, it's a bit of a hassle to deal with, uh, but 
I guess we did it. Uh, and if you keep all the rotating terms, basically, uh, so there's no, you don't use rotating wave approximations, basically, uh, then that enables you to get these kind of good fits uh, to the experimental data. Um, we didn't, we didn't kind of refer to this as any kind of like formal theory, we kind of just did it. Uh, but subsequently, uh, people have written papers around this and they, they refer to these kind of techniques as uh, Lyapunov Floquet theory. If you know what a Lyapunov equation is and Floquet theory is, then that name will kind of makes sense to you. Um, all right, key point, we have a good quantitative understanding of what those pump spectra look like. Um, again, the probe tones are kind of, uh, uh, are kind of relatively easy to calculate and they give you the direct measure of X plus. Um, I might just kind of skip this one a little bit um, since I see a lot of time has already elapsed. Uh, two mode squeezing and entanglement. Um, so what are we showing here? Uh, well, we can make a measurement of this uh, rotated uh, collective quadrature, X plus and P plus. Um, and so we can scan through phi by choosing basically the, the, the phases of our uh, pump tones. And if we choose phi just right so that we're really measuring X plus, the one that we think we're two mode squeezing, uh, then the variance of X plus drops below one half, uh, which is below the level of uh, zero point fluctuations. So there's two independent data sets, both of which, uh, you know, have their error bounds fully below the zero point fluctuations, right? That one just there is kind of just a zoom in of that thing right there. Uh, and again, that's not enough, right? That, so that's two mode squeezing, but it's not entanglement, right? Entanglement requires kind of the, the, the two uh, metrics. This one we measure directly. This one is inferred, so P minus, that is inferred from the fit to the pump spectrum, uh, which is, as I say, much messier than the probe spectrum. All right, if you do that, then the key point for two different data sets, right, you have uh, basically uh, the sum of these two quantities, the variance of X plus and P minus below uh, the bound in the Duan criterion. Okay, which is to say we have a bunch of different data points over two independent data sets for which the Duan criterion, uh, I could, you could say is violated, i.e. the oscillators are entangled and not separable. Again, and picking off these two data points, you can basically look at what this Duan criterion looks like as a function of G minus, which is essentially a measure of uh, pump strength. Um, and again, two data points for which the system is entangled, right? The, the best guess we have on the number is uh, 0 0.83 with error bars of plus minus uh, 0 0.13, i.e. the mechanical oscillators are entangled. Okay. So, so, so there's a few limitations uh, in what has just been described. One, we, we can't measure every single quadrature. Okay. Uh, and two, we don't have the direct measurement of entanglement. Okay. So, uh, you know, how do you go from one to the other? Uh, well, basically, in terms of, uh, you know, the theory side of things, you just keep on adding uh, drives and pumps uh, and make sure you track all their phases into tunings correctly. Uh, you know, from, a, from an experimental perspective, uh, you pull off an impressive feat of microwave engineering, uh, which is to say, instead of having four tones in the experiment, you have eight and you keep them all phase locked uh, and stable with respect to each other. Um, and I'm reliably informed that that is an impressive feat of microwave engineering. Uh, the end result of that is we can fully explore uh, the so-called quantum mechanics free subspace and generate entanglement and detect any quadrature of it. Okay, so this was the experiment uh, published earlier this year. The theory proposals, again, they're quite old by now. So this has been kind of an eight year uh, concern working on this stuff uh, for me at least. All right, uh, so this is maybe a bit of a repeat of what I said earlier. Uh, you can construct this quantum mechanics free subspace between certain variables. Uh, so for example, X plus and P minus, where uh, you know, they are dynamically coupled, but they commute. Okay, hence the term quantum mechanics free subspace because they commute. Uh, so you can construct it from X plus and P minus or X minus and P plus. So what is the setup this time? Uh, the setup this time is that there's a second cavity, right? Before there were two uh, microwave uh, mechanical oscillators uh, and one microwave cavity. Now there's two mechanical oscillators and uh, you know two uh, microwave cavities, right? So it's kind of indicated here. So kind of there's a low frequency mode out here and there's kind of a high frequency mode 
uh, microwave in there, and then the uh, mechanical oscillators uh, kind of in there, and they are mechanically coupled to both. All right, so the Hamiltonian looks kind of the same as before, uh, except, so this is just the Hamiltonian corresponding to one cavity. Uh, there are two cavities, right? So you should kind of, uh, you know, add another cavity oscillator and add another two couplings, right, to get the full thing. Uh, this is just uh, considering the coupling to one cavity mode. Right here, one cavity, you associate with it uh, four pump tones, right? Uh, it's probably not time to go into the detail, but what are the advantages of having four pump tones, not four, uh, not two? It means every scattering process, basically up and down off both mechanical oscillators, you control it independently. So you can control independently the, the magnitude and the phase. Uh, what this means practically is you don't have to get that very good match between the single photon of the mechanical couplings, right? They were within 2% before. That was just luck of fabrication. They don't have those kind of tolerances. Um, it means the effective oscillator frequency, which is this capital omega, you can tune uh, and you can measure any one of four collective uh, quadratures. Um, again, maybe I'll gloss over a bit of detail here. Uh, key point, uh, you wind up with a Hamiltonian that looks kind of the same in terms of the positive mass, negative mass dynamics. Uh, but now your cavity operator, that's this A here, you can choose to couple to X minus, X plus, P minus, P plus. These coefficients, A minus, A plus, B minus, B plus, you can tune them to be whatever you want just by uh, choosing basically the, the phase of your pump tones. I should say you can actually tune the magnitude of the coupling uh, in general as well, but this is written under the assumption that the magnitude of the coupling is the same in each uh, for each pump tone. All right, basically that means we can explore any two mode back action evading measurement and have complete control over the, uh, the two mode squeezing or entanglement. All right, uh, four probe tones as well, four pumps, four probes, total of eight. Uh, two cavities separated by you know almost a couple of gigahertz two mechanical oscillators uh, again separated by you know a couple of megahertz in this case again you can do the clean uh, two mode back action evading measurements uh, the measurement ultimately that you get here uh, without going into details is uh, 8 db below the level of quantum back action uh, so that 8 db below the level of quantum back action is comparing uh, these green dots, uh, which is basically the variance of X, whatever you're measuring, uh, from the uh, variance associated with the uh, back action, which is kind of up here. Uh, by choosing the, the phases of your uh, pump tones, uh, basically as indicated in any of these places, I can basically explore any kind of subset of these collective uh, quadrature operators. And, you know, I know I'm going quite fast at this point in time. Uh, in any case, uh, you, you can kind of measure X plus and then you change your tones, right? And you start measuring P plus. You can go from X plus and start measuring P minus or any linear combination thereof. And you can always do it in kind of a back action evading way, right? So here you're, this is where the back action would be, but it's not, not there because it's back action evading. So we always see the, the variance down at this level and down at this level. Furthermore, we can use this trick that we used before where you kind of officially measure, uh, say, X plus with the pump and then explore the other uh, quadratures using the probe tones. And right, that's what's shown in this last figure here. So basically in the green, basically you're always measuring something in the quantum mechanics free subspace. In the black, you start measuring something in the quantum mechanics free subspace, then you probe something orthogonal to it. And then in the red case up the top here, you're always exploring something which is in the subspace in which back action is being kind of, well, foist upon it. All right, uh, and so now we have this tool at our disposal, we can directly measure the Dwan quantity. Uh, and that's what's shown here. Uh, again, these are kind of like uh, probe spectra. Here is basically an investigation of this collective quadrature operator showing that you can measure X plus any linear combination through to P plus. Here is showing you can measure any combination within the quantum mechanics free subspace, uh, which is X plus P minus. 
and then you can measure that combination as well. So this is the Duan quantity, um, and we can actually measure, you know, those conjugate uh, observ the observables which appear in the Duan quantity over a variety of phases. Um, and again, that's the kind of separability bound. We're below the separability bound. Therefore, here we have a clean and direct measurement of the entanglement of these uh, massive mechanical oscillators. All right, so I think I need to wrap up. Uh, so I was going to talk, uh, well, perhaps I knew I was going to run out of time. Uh, force sensing, many body control. Uh, so force sensing, non-stationary, uh, using these kind of schemes in a non-stationary manner for enhanced force sensing is something you can think about. Uh, can you extend these to kind of, you know, uh, distribute entanglement over arrays of these systems? Uh, yes, you can. We've characterized that as well. Uh, and more recently, you end up doing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, calculations with master equations and what have you in these things. Uh, and in particular, we're often dealing with these kind of generalized Lindblad master equations. Uh, maybe you can use some kind of linear algebraic quick uh, tricks, sorry, uh, to make these calculations a little less painful. And that's what this is about right here. Um, yeah, I think I, I'm pretty much out of time. So I, I will leave you with my conclusions uh, for you to read. Uh, thank you, uh, David. Thanks very much, Matt. That was uh, really interesting. They're certainly very delightful experiments. Um, yeah. Yeah, can I, can I start with a really dumb, naive question? On, on the pictures that you had um, uh, way back when you showed a diagram of all the various mechanical systems, I think it was slide one or two yep. or something. Sure thing. So the question that I was interested in, these, I mean, they're, they're, they're fascinating um, mechanical systems. So how much control do you have over the, I mean, how pure are these systems as quantum systems? I mean, how many modes of spurious modes of oscillation do you get? Um, yeah, you so, understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so, so I mean, in some sense, you're, you're right. I mean, there's obviously never just a fundamental mode, right? There's always the harmonics as well. And so typically you're just probing that fundamental, uh, controlling and probing that fundamental mode of vibration. So yeah, th there are potentially other modes which are not in their ground state. So that is true. And in that in that top left hand picture there, it sort of yep. shows the diagram suggests that the mode of oscillation that they're using is is like this type of mode rather than something yeah. like this. If I if I understand yeah. correctly, so, so, so that's so that's accurate. So so I guess one of the key considerations here is what is the resonance frequency, right? The higher frequency you go to, the easier it is to put something in its ground state, right? So yeah. so this one here is like six gigahertz, you know put six gigahertz into a 20 millikelvin environment and calculate you know its Bose occupation and you may find uh you know a number less than one right and it's like congratulations you've prepared that mechanical degree of freedom in its quantum ground state right so in this particular example what they did was they just took a really high frequency so it's it's kind of like a torsional degree of freedom right and so that was presumably uh more or less selected because it was like i don't know six gigahertz like high frequency and so that's a kind of a good frequency for operation of these, you know, superconducting quantum bits, and therefore you can potentially resonantly couple, right? So the way this kind of stuff worked right here is they just had resonant uh, interactions between the qubit and the uh, mechanical degree of freedom. And so really it's kind of like almost like a state swap operation between the qubit and the, uh, and the uh, mechanical degree of freedom. Uh, it, this was, I mean, this is perhaps a slightly uh, you know, maybe controversial uh, experiment because it was, you know, a little bit unclear where kind of, you know, the acoustic uh, degree of freedom starts and, you know, where the uh, electrical uh, degree of freedom starts. Um, so I would say uh, these ones are much cleaner in some sense, um, but these these are not resonant interactions, right? So these, these are all kind of like, you know, Fundamentally, they're like Stokes and anti-Stokes, uh, you know, type type interactions. Um, so I would say these ones are, in some sense, a lot cleaner. And even these ones, in terms of like the localization of the acoustic mode away from the electrical mode, uh, is I would say much cleaner uh, in these types of experiments here than it was in this one. This was very much a pioneering experiment. Um, and I would say, you know, these the levitated ones, which really are the ones of a lot of interest um uh for kind of all this gravity stuff um is sort of of uh you know i mean optimally kind of clean in the sense that they're kind of decoupled from the environment around them 
Oh, yeah, that's really interesting. And and the the middle one at the top there, that's is that an example of the the Dramos ladder that you referred to later? Yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, again, so this is just kind of like some meandering strip line uh, resonator yeah. that you have over here, and it's just capacitively coupled into this uh, capacitor. All oh, right, and then the capacitance is is modulated by the instantaneous difference in in distance is it between the resonating yeah uh, surface and the surrounding structure is that what we're seeing yeah so i mean a, a very very simple model gets you a long way right so if you think of what is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor at something like you know if i get this right epsilon naught a on d right yeah, that's the it. d is changing uh, yeah, yeah. well done <laughs> <Right>. thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I passed second year physics, maybe. Uh, but but so, so D is now like D naught plus X, right? You know, yeah. because X is so incredibly tiny as compared with D, right? You can Taylor expand that to first order. And then, you know, in the simplest possible picture, your capacitive energy is like Q squared X, right? So in, in right. the case of, I mean, Q squared X, uh, you know, well, X gives me the B1 plus B1 dagger, essentially, that I was talking about, and Q squared essentially gives me the A dagger A. So that's how that capacitive coupling kind of immediately gives rise to one of these kind of radiation pressure-like interactions. All oh, right, yeah. And the, I mean, this um, back action evading uh, experiment that you've got, that's really clever. Um, I wanted to ask you, so when you're setting up that experiment and you're using these sort of structures, what sort of cue can you expect from these structures? I mean, how, how narrow is the uh, yeah. line width of the oscillations associated with these? Yeah, yeah. So, so I did give the, I, well, I didn't give the cue exactly, but you gave the numbers from which you can figure it out. Um, so let me just get it absolutely right. Because I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, so it's, it's, you know, it's the ratio of that oscillation frequency, right? So it's 10 megahertz, um, you know, so it's at 10 to the 8 divided by the uh, line width, uh, which is 10 squared, right? Oh, so it's about, it's about 10 good. to the six. So 10 to it's, the six. It's, it's extremely good, isn't it? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, I mean, other people know these numbers better than me off the top of the head, but, uh, you know, uh, some, some of the, I think kind of their hypes, high hopes for, you know, getting very high quality factors in these levitated optomechanical uh, systems, which if I recall correctly, comes down to how, how low pressure you can sort of get in the kind of uh, the cavity in which that optomechanical system is levitated. What was wonderful was the fact that you you could get down to the uh, to the you know to the uh, quantum vacuum levels in a, in a number of experiments with appropriate squeezing. That was really yeah. um, surprising to me. But yeah, yeah, and, and beyond. I mean, so yeah, I mean, it's kind of I mean, it's easy to be kind of blasé about these things, I, I suppose. But like you know, I mean. I mean, these guys were quite brave to put <laughs> to put yes. hats on P and Q, right? In 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 1993. I mean, I, I was doing my PhD like you know 15 years after this, and I was skeptical uh, about sort of putting hats on P's and Q's. And right, I was only doing this like a couple of years before the you know experience became a real thing. Um, but yeah, it's um, it, it is incredible, and it does kind of warrant some reflection. It's amazing. Archil has a question in the Q and A panel. He asks, "Would you?" Uh, say a little more about force sensing, please. Yeah. All right. So, so there's there's lots of catches, I guess, on the force sensing. So I don't know how much you've kind of thought about this. Um, so, you know, the what you what the, the kind of naive thing is. Well, you know, if you uh, just cool an oscillator, won't it be better at force sensing? It's kind of well established that no, just cooling an oscillator does not make you better at force sensing. Uh, the reason being. Uh, you know, by cooling, you're reducing the noise. That's true, but you're also increasing the line width. You know, by virtue of how the uh, by how by, by how the cooling works, you necessarily kind of increase the line width of your oscillator or you increase the damping, which means you're less responsive to an external force. And those two things kind of neatly cancel out, and uh, ultimately lead to the conclusion that you actually are not improving your force sensing in general just by cooling or just by doing something in the stationary. Uh, or sort of time uh, independent regime. So the, the calculation that I kind of glossed over right at the end um, was basically about doing, uh, so this is just a single loss later, right? The, the idea is that you prepare a squeeze state, right? And then kind of suddenly switch that off, right? And then uh, uh, we don't even have to switch it off, but you, you provide an initial condition, uh, which is squeezed. Uh, and then after that point, uh, measure in kind of a back action evading way, 
uh, and measure for a finite time and sort of measure while the oscillator is kind of rethermalizing. And, you know, if you do that, uh, then you kind of, there's a short period of time for which there's some sort of benefit uh, in the uh, signal to noise ratio as compared with not preparing that kind of special non-thermal initial state. Um, this is kind of like a, I guess, a funny area in general, uh, because, you know, I think kind of these problems are of interest uh, to physics people, right, generally. But, you know, people who think about, you know, these things classically, uh, you know, particularly kind of radar type people and like statistical signal processing people, you know, have a, have a full artillery of tools for dealing with these types of problems, which I would say have not been fully and properly deployed uh, on these types of problems. Um, so, you know, we were doing this kind of very much from like a quantum optics perspective, I would say. Uh, but, you know, I think actually there's still work to be done in fully understanding the limits and potential of force sensing these types of scenarios using kind of the proper kind of estimation framework that, you know, like a radar theory person would use. Um, so I, th I think the story is very incomplete on the force sensing side of things. It's very interesting though, particularly as it has the prospect perhaps to test some of the early paradoxes, if we want to call it, of uh, quantum mechanics to test the limit of um, quantum mechanics. Yeah, so, so, so on that, I mean, I, I kind of flagged as a motivator the tests of quantum mechanics. I mean, I, I think, in some sense, I would call the things that have been done thus far, they're more demonstrations of quantum mechanics. I mean, they're fully consistent with quantum mechanics, but they're not some sort of rigorous, uh, you know, there's not some like rigorous, in general, not some rigorous kind of hypothesis testing framework that kind of rules out this particular classes of, you know, models in the context of these systems. And that, that's something that could be done and might be of interest to, to particular, particular people. But I think kind of the fact that, you know, this possible interaction with gravity is also there. I think that's kind of what's a lot of people have been kind of, you know, drawn away from these kind of maybe like a bell inequality kind of test in these types of systems. People have gone straight to gravity, which is, you know, a much more difficult thing. <laughs> Uh, to sort of access experimentally, I think it's fair to say. But, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a more ambitious thing to think about, I guess. Right. Um, and I wasn't, I haven't really ever come across the Duan criterion that you mentioned. Is that, is that a separability criterion for continuous systems? Is, is, is that yeah. what a way of yeah. characterizing that? Yeah, that's a fair characterization. Uh, it's not the only one. Uh, so, I mean, I think, so it's, uh, yeah, I mean, as I say, it's, it's basically, you know, given by the summation of, uh, you know, two uh, collective operators of a two-mode oscillator system. Um, there's also a product form of it, which actually predates it, which is uh, due to Tan and uh, other Auckland people, uh, which is basically you just multiply the two variances uh, rather than uh, sort of add them. And that, again, gives you a simple criterion for a sort of entangled versus separable. Uh, and there's, you know, I mean, as I kind of maybe uh, indirectly alluded to, uh, you know, there's kind of uh, the link is often made from like entanglement back to the original EPR paper that, right, you can do tests for like EPR correlations, which are about kind of uh, measurement inferences. Um, and people have done those things in other contexts, though not uh, in the context of these uh, mechanical, uh, sort of macroscopic mechanical oscillators, let's say. All oh, right. And um, my final question was about, uh, there's no other questions in the Q&A panel at the moment. Anybody who wants to ask one, please feel free to, to type it in. Um, I was just going to ask you on slide, I think it was 26 or 27. Um, yeah. I was just looking at the, I was just trying to understand the uh, 20s, 25 maybe. No, 20. There is no 25. Oh, there is no 25. 26. <laughs> title. Uh, go forward. Uh, no, you had it was the slide where you had the hammer. Oh, there it is. That's the one. Yep. Okay. So, um, so um, omega c and omega j. Uh, omega c here was the pump frequency, right? So just to be so omega c is the cavity resonance frequency. So I, yeah. I, I know there's there's a, that's, that's the central frequency, the primary frequency you're driving the cavity at, right? So so no. So so that's the oh. cavity resonance. Uh, oh, right. but, the, but the pump tones are all detuned. So, so there's actually no driving oh, nice. okay. at, at the cavity resonance frequency. There's a lot of frequencies to track uh, here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. apologize. So, so those Omega J are the, the mechanical oscillator frequencies and the forward drive tones of these ones 
So one basically refers to pretty much detuned close to the mechanical resonance right. frequency of oscillator one. And right. omega two means pretty much detuned by the, detuned from the cavity resonance, I mean, by the uh, resonance frequency of mechanical oscillator two. Oh, I got, um, I got it. I got it. Right. But not exactly. So, I mean, the effective oscillator is created by that detuning in actual fact. And the final term there is an interaction term, right? Uh, which one are we referring to? The, yeah, the term one. that involves the coefficients G, G yeah, sub J. Yeah. So, so that's kind of like this radiation pressure, uh, like yeah. up the yeah. mechanical coupling. Uh, but as I noted uh, before, um, uh, you can actually get that out from a very simple, like, Take a uh, take the energy of a parallel plate capacitor and Taylor expand it to first order, and then quantize it, and then you'll yes. get that interaction. So I mean, it comes very naturally out of both radiation pressure. Um, right. Yeah. And so and so I, I did notice the question uh, from Brian. Um, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so certainly uh, you know as I mentioned before, uh, people have there are theory papers on just, you know, just it, sorry Matt. just for the purposes of the video people won't watching it later won't okay, actually sure. see the question so i might just read the question uh so brian asks i wonder if you would uh, it be possible to see epr steering or bell non-locality effects as well as quantum entanglement in these mechanical oscillator systems there are several criteria that have been developed to test whether these uh, non-classical effects occur Sorry to interrupt, man. Yeah, no, that's good. It's, it's a good question. Uh, so certainly, certainly there are proposals uh, around doing these things. Um, uh, you know, for, and for people unaware, there's kind of, you know, I mean, in some sense, your point, this kind of, this is a point to hierarchies of quantum correlations uh, beyond entanglement. Uh, certainly there exist proposals for doing these things. Uh, I am unaware of any kind of experimental group really going after these things. And I, I would say the reason for that is probably twofold. Uh, one, one, I guess one reason for that is, uh, you know, people have started thinking about, oh, gravity, gravity, right? Gravity is going to matter. And so pe people's attention has perhaps been drawn away from these tests of quantum mechanics. And the other thing is people's attention has also been drawn away by this kind of, some of these kind of signal processing ideas, which kind of also makes sense in the context of these systems are around, you know, potentially amplifiers or uh, microwave to optical converters. So certainly proposals exist. Uh, I'm unaware of any kind of experimental group kind of very seriously uh, pursuing these things. Uh, at the same time, uh, I haven't been to many conferences lately, so it's possible I'm just out of the loop. Uh, well, that, that's really fascinating. I don't think there's any more questions. Thanks very much, Matt, for a really fascinating talk. This is a really interesting area. Um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what evolves over the next few years with this, with this area of research. And I would just remind everybody that, that within a few days, this talk will be um, available to watch again, as are all the others on the Australian YouTube, uh, this, sorry, the Australian Institute of Physics YouTube channel. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, uh, we would love to see you at the next seminar. We haven't decided exactly what that's going to be just yet, but we will inform everyone by email in the usual way. So thank you very much, Matt. All right. Thanks, David. It was a great talk. Cheers. Thanks.